Pixel is the phone by Google, but there's more to Google and phones than you might think. Almost a decade before the first Pixel, rumors circulated around a possible G phone to take on Apple's iPhone. Google had just acquired Android after all. Then came the G1, the very first Android phone, and various flavors of Nexus before we eventually arrived at phones with a big G on the back. This is the story of the Google Pixel series, how the Google phones we have today came to be, and how it's taken the past seven generations of development to really figure out what a Google phone should be, with a fair few missteps and false starts along the way. Over six years, we've gone from Pixel being a phone defined by stock Android and great cameras, to one built around semi-magical AI-powered features. In this video, we'll see how the Pixel's fortunes have transformed over time, from the Pixel 1 all the way through to the Pixel 7 today, and we'll also get a look at some of the unseen Pixels that didn't make the cut over the years. There's a lot to get stuck into here, so take a sec to subscribe, and we'll dive in. Android phones have been around since 2008, and all of them have had at least some Google influence, but the Google phone story really starts in earnest with the Nexus program. Before the Pixel was anywhere close to being a thing, the Google phone in any given year would be built in partnership with a chosen Android phone maker, and usually designed to showcase one or two key features from that year's major software update. 2010's Nexus S, for instance, was among the first phones to support NFC, the technology behind Google Pay. And the Galaxy Nexus in 2011 showcased a large HD display with on-screen keys as a canvas for the new Android design language of the time. While Nexus phones were popular among enthusiasts and fans like me, I really loved phones like the Galaxy Nexus and Nexus 4. They were a real mixed bag in terms of shape, size, and consistency. Not surprising, you might think, for a line of products that changed manufacturers every single year. There was never really any long-term plan for where Nexus as a brand would go. It was always handled ad hoc from year to year. There's little to connect the small LG Nexus 4 and medium-sized Nexus 5, for instance, with the absolute unit that was the Motorola Nexus 6, even though they were technically direct successors to each other. And the situation got even messier when there were Nexus tablets and other things thrown into the mix. The only common thread running through the series was that stock Android software experience. Even that was somewhat muddied by Google's ventures into selling phones directly outside of Nexus. In 2013, there was a brief foray into Google Play Experience phones, a short-lived experiment which saw the big G selling unlocked versions of popular flagships like the Galaxy S4 and HTC One with clean Nexus-like software. And for a brief time, Google actually owned a major smartphone manufacturer itself. It acquired Motorola in 2012 to avert a looming Android patent apocalypse. The previous Moto leadership had been threatening to hammer Android competitors with patent royalties, forcing Google's hand. Motorola, briefly a Google company before being sold to Lenovo in 2014, was led by company president Rick Ostelow. He would later rejoin Google to head up the Pixel hardware division in 2016. And his work at Moto kind of served as a prototype for what he'd go on to try and build at Google later in the decade. So you get the idea. It was a messy, very suboptimal situation for anyone who wanted a proper Google phone with a reliable upgrade path from year to year, which led in late 2015 to some prominent critics calling for Google to just bite the bullet and make a proper Google phone in which they control both the hardware and the software. And turns out someone in Mountain View may have been listening. So it's 2016 and everyone in the Android world is expecting another Nexus. That's just how things worked at this point. The online rumor mill was suggesting HTC, down on its luck but still very much a presence in the smartphone industry, would be the partner of choice. That was backed up by subsequent reporting that Huawei, who had made 2015's Nexus phones, had turned down the chance to work with Google on another handset. What turned out to be more interesting was the alleged reason for Huawei walking away from the deal with Google. Nexus was going away, and the Google phones of 2016 would be created as part of an ODM arrangement, meaning Huawei, or whoever else, would be making phones for Google under contract, in a similar way to how Foxconn works for Apple to assemble the iPhone. These would be Google's phones, not Huawei's. This is reportedly a deal breaker for Huawei, and in particular its CEO Richard Yu, who wanted to grow his brand's presence in the West. The Nexus 6P was a co-branded product. It had a big old Huawei logo on the back and raised the company's profile quite a bit in places like the US. So if these new phones didn't help Huawei to build its brand identity, then what was the point? As a result, Google turned to HTC to build what became the original Pixel and Pixel XL. The Pixel branding came from a couple of devices Google had previously launched, the Pixel C tablet and the Chromebook Pixel. And the abandoned Huawei Pixel design ended up being recycled for the mid-range Huawei Nova, which launched in fall 2016 and looked basically like a shrunken down Nexus 6P. 
When the first gen pixels launched, there were two main things to set them apart from other Android phones, even previous Nexus models like the 6P. These were the first phones to launch with Google Assistant built in, a big deal in the early days of AI voice assistants and a clear differentiator versus other Android phones, which just had plain old Google Voice Search. And they were the first phones to push computational photography in a big way with HDR plus and multi-frame processing enabled in every photo the Pixel camera took. HDR plus itself wasn't new, but enabling it for every photo was a big deal that elevated the Pixel camera above pretty much everything else at the time. HDR Plus debuted as an option on the Nexus 5 in 2013 based on technology designed for Google Glass, the abandoned smart glasses project in 2012. Glass's tiny image sensor was low quality and needed special software to help it take multiple exposures and, through post-processing magic, number crunch them together into an image with better clarity and dynamic range. Turns out this technology scaled pretty well to cameras that live in your pocket as well as ones strapped to your face. I remember being in China shortly after the Pixel launched and being pretty amazed by these two new tentpole features of my original Pixel XL. I could ask it, through a VPN of course, what the building in Shanghai that looked like a bottle opener was and it would know exactly what I meant. And it would help me take some pretty stunning photos of that bottle opener at the same time. The Pixel's first year on the market coincided with a lot of travel for me personally, and so when I think back to this phone six years on, what I mostly remember is what it helped me shoot, and how far ahead of the curve this camera was in a phone competing with the Samsung Galaxy S7 and iPhone 7. Although it was missing extra conveniences like water resistance and wireless charging, and it started with just 32 gigs of internal storage, the things that made the Pixel special were so special back then that I really didn't care about the things that it couldn't do. For me personally, mainly because of that Pixel camera, this is my favorite phone of 2016 by a country mile. The second generation Pixels arrived amidst a fair amount of upheaval at Google and its manufacturer partner HTC. HTC had seen the fortunes of its own smartphone business further decline going into 2017. At the same time, if Google was going to become a major player in smartphones, it would need to build out its own engineering and R&D capacity. The mutual solution for both companies was a sort of acquire hiring of around 2,000 HTC engineers by Google, mainly people who had already been working closely on the Pixel project. Google got extra manpower and expertise, and HTC got $1.1 billion. These engineers would continue to work out of the HTC HQ building in New Taipei City, but became fully-fledged Google employees, answering to the Google leadership in Mountain View. This wasn't quite Google buying out HTC's smartphone division, as some portrayed it at the time, but it did basically bookend HTC's time as a top-tier phone maker. The HTC U11 Plus, released in late 2017, was really the last competitive phone to come out of the Taiwanese company, and it would give up on flagship phones entirely in the following year. Now, originally the plan was for HTC to once again make both the Pixel 2 and Pixel 2 XL. In the end though, manufacturing duties were split between HTC for the small Pixel 2 and LG for the 2 XL. Both featured pretty typical incremental spec upgrades and now packed a roomy of 64 gigs of base storage plus water resistance, a first in any Google phone. But before we move on, it's worth talking about that cancelled HTC Pixel 2 XL. For a long time, this was only known about thanks to references to its specs in the open source Android code. But then in 2021, a pre-production unit cropped up in the wild and was leaked online thanks to YouTuber Hikari Kalix. As you can see here, it's literally just a blown up version of the smaller Pixel 2. From speaking to sources over the years, the main reason for the switch of manufacturers for the 2XL had to do with design and price. The HTC model had large top and bottom borders, which made it look dated next to competitors like the Samsung Galaxy S8 series. And with its smaller bezels, LG, with its background in OLED technology, could manufacture a better looking phone for less. But that LG OLED technology actually ended up being the cause of one of the major controversies around this phone. Early reviews of the 2XL noted issues with noise or grey in the display at low brightness levels, and a few days later some people, including me, started to notice a kind of ghosting of previous images, basically shadows of things that were previously on the screen staying when they should have already disappeared, for example the on-screen navigation keys. Usually a dark grey background was the best way of observing this. With a typical OLED, this kind of burn-in normally doesn't happen until after several years of use, so it looked pretty bad considering these phones were just a few days old. But there was some debate at the time over whether this was actually real permanent image burn-in to do with how an OLED panel ages or just image persistence, which was temporary and eventually fades. At the very least, I didn't notice it getting worse during my time with the Pixel 2 XL, but it still wasn't ideal and gave the impression that even after two generations, Google was still struggling with some of those hardware basics. 
And performance bugs affecting some older pixels also cropped up during the life of the Pixel 2, with a lot of prominent blogs and YouTubers showing how these phones could succumb to bit rot over months or years of use. Software issues like this aren't something you expect to see in a phone from the company that makes the OS, and it made for unflattering comparisons with other fan favorite phones at the time like the OnePlus 5 series. My Pixel 2 has felt like it's slowed down uh, much more than other phones have in the same amount of time I've owned it. And to top it all off, this was also around the time the class action lawsuit was kicking off around microphone issues in the original Pixel phones. Away from all the drama around bugs and substandard screens, I actually really enjoyed the Pixel 2 XL through 2017 and into 2018. The screen, sure, it was objectively one of the worst in a flagship phone at that time, but the trade-off in the other direction was once again well worth it for me. No one else could match the Pixel's stellar camera and its unique on-device AI trickery. Optical image stabilization made the Pixel's camera better in low light, front-facing portrait mode worked surprisingly well for the time, Meanwhile, a revamped Pixel UI and ambient computing features like Now Playing, identifying music in the background, rounded off an impressive software feature set. Plus, Google Lens arrived, kind of a reverse image search on steroids, always available within the Pixel's camera. And the Pixel Visual Core, disabled out of the box but later activated in over-the-air update, helped implement Google's HDR Plus magic in hardware, making it faster and allowing it to work with more apps. This was our first taste of Google Custom Silicon in a Pixel, obviously a huge trend later on. This, plus OIS in the camera, helped the second generation Pixel take even better photos than the first. But I think what helped more was the maturity of Google's image processing algorithms, making for a more reliable camera to use in any situation. I took so many great shots with this camera that stand up to pictures you'd shoot with a flagship camera today. It was an early sign that you don't necessarily need top shelf sensors to take amazing photos on a phone. Just as well because Google stuck with almost this exact same sensor for another two generations of mainline Pixels after this. Even the Pixel 6a launched in summer 2022 uses a sensor that has an updated part number but is basically identical to the Sony IMX362 first seen way back in the Pixel 2. So when the Pixel 3 came around in 2018, Google was starting to put artificial intelligence at the heart of everything it did, as evidenced by an AI-packed string of announcements at its I.O. conference that summer. As Google Assistant became more conversational, the highlight of I.O. 2018 was an early look at Project Duplex, a first-of-its-kind feature that let Google Assistant call businesses and make reservations on your behalf. I'm calling to book a women's haircut for our clients. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Hi, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. When the Pixel 3 series launched that fall, they boasted yet more exclusive intelligent features like Smart Compose for sentences in Gmail and call screening for handling unknown callers. Kind of led me to think that the future of phone calls is just ultimately going to be duplex talking to Google call screening over and over again. Anyway, all of this made a more compelling case than ever before for a Google phone. No other manufacturer could offer AI-enhanced features like this. The Pixel's raison d'etre wasn't just to showcase stock Android as Google envisioned it, but to be a platform for the software and services that made Google so powerful. On the other hand, Google also made a big push behind Daydream, its since-shuttered VR platform that used a smartphone's display inside its headset. Daydream stuck around for a couple of generations before finally joining the Google Graveyard in 2019 as standalone headsets emerged as the preferred choice for mobile VR. Guess you can't win them all. By the time the Pixel 3 launched, Google had already had around a year to bring those ex-HTC engineers into the fold. But around this time, HTC was starting to wind down its smartphone manufacturing base in Taiwan. So the phone itself was built on a contract by Foxconn in China, a big milestone for Google, who up to that point had always worked with one of its Android partners to make Nexus or Pixel phones. So the first thing you notice about the Pixel 3 XL in particular is this great big honking notch up top. Google fully embraced the extra deep cutout here to accommodate its front-facing speakers and dual selfie cameras. On the small Pixel 3, these lived in the top portion of the more uniform screen bezels. This is an easy thing to make fun of today, but even back then, I didn't hate this big display cutout. The edge-to-edge -edge display and the rest of the top bezel made for a striking design, and the dual selfie cameras contained within it let you capture excellent super-wide selfies unlike any other flagship at the time. 
To allow wireless charging, the back panel was now made of glass, but with a dual tone matte plus glossy finish that emulated the metal feel of previous pixels. These were among the better built pixels in my opinion, with a slick painted trim and superb displays this time made by Samsung. Bye bye image persistent and ghosting. For the time, these were decent flagship phones set apart by a handful of unique features, but even so, Google was starting to show signs of falling behind in one or two areas of the hardware. The Pixel camera, at least around the back, was still a single sensor affair. There was no ultra-wide or telephoto yet. Instead, Google used souped-up digital zoom based on the movement of the sensor's OIS module to take better zoom shots. SuperRes zoom, as it was called, worked okay, but you could see a clear difference versus a true telephoto camera. And both phones launched with just 4GB of RAM, surprisingly low for a flagship phone, and this led to a common issue with the Pixel 3 XL in particular, where if you were listening to music or a podcast in the background while taking a bunch of photos, the camera app would quickly use up all your available memory, causing the audio to stop. Also, battery life is just not spectacular on the smaller Pixel 3 with only a 2800mAh battery. As with the Pixel 2 XL's display or the original Pixel's lack of water resistance or extra storage, Google was missing the mark with some of the basics, important table stakes features that you really should be expecting in an expensive flagship phone in 2018. But perhaps just as frustratingly, it was nailing many of the things that most other Android manufacturers really struggled with. The software experience, AI features, and of course that legendary Pixel image processing. A couple months after launch, the Pixel 3 picked up its most impressive feature, Night Sight. This wasn't the very first handheld low-light shooting mode, but it was a thoroughly impressive extension of the work that Google started with HDR Plus back in Pixels 1 and 2, and Google eventually backported this excellent new night mode to the earlier two Pixels as well. As someone who took a lot of photos on my Pixels, Night Sight seemed almost magical, opening up yet more possibilities for what was, in my view, still the best phone camera overall at the time. Night Sight and a bunch of other Pixel 3 features also carried over to Google's first mid-range Pixels in mid-2019. The Pixel 3a and 3a XL swapped out the metal and glass for a plastic body and opted for a cheaper Snapdragon 600 series processor to cut costs. But as a product, it was arguably more balanced than the mainline Pixel 3, and the pricing made these two one of the more competitive Pixel phones. The first three generations of Pixels had had their challenges, but all had generally been quite well received. That said, the critical praise of these phones hadn't yet translated into widespread sales success. These were fairly niche, mostly expensive phones that were only available in a few countries. Estimates from ZDNet in 2019 put the Pixel 3 series at somewhere between 10 and 12.5 million units sold in their first year. Small potatoes in the grand scheme of the smartphone industry are nowhere near the level of a Samsung or an Apple. So the Google Pixel 4 series tried to take things in a different direction in 2019. Once again, we had two phones, a Pixel 4 and a 4 XL, and a more uniform design this time around, thanks to the new Soli radar array contained in the top bezel. As well as secure face unlock, this could let you control your phone from afar using wavy hand gestures, or motion sense as Google called it. The gestures were supposed to work more reliably than previous attempts because of the miniaturized radar array used in the top bezel, and Google had a bunch of really neat demos of this around the time. The Pixel 4 was extensively leaked in the run-up to launch, not least by Google itself, which publicly teased the solely radar trickery after CAD images of the phone emerged online. After years of phones that had generally been quite good, though hit and miss in places, the hope among Pixel fans was that this could finally be the year that Google would deliver on the promise of what a Pixel should be, while also nailing the essentials, things like battery life and multitasking performance. And nope. Instead, what the Pixel 4 delivered was mostly another year of weird compromises. Those Pixel 3 battery issues basically carried over in their entirety to the Pixel 4, especially in the smaller model. I remember using the small Pixel 4 alongside a Huawei Mate 30 Pro on a bunch of international trips in late 2019. I'd be actively using the Mate and keeping the Pixel 4 mostly in my pocket, and both batteries would drain at the same rate. This is seriously some of the worst battery life I've seen in any device. Around the time of the Pixel 4's launch, it was even reported that Pixel boss Rick Ostrolo was critical of the phone's battery life, and rightly so, but surely this was something to be addressed and corrected during development, as opposed to criticizing after the fact. 
Motion Sense also fell flat with only a few gestures available at launch and the reliability of those controls falling far short of what had been promised. Plus the fact that Motion Sense used a tiny radar array limited the countries in which the Pixel 4 could be sold. Step off a plane in a country where Google hasn't filed the necessary paperwork and your Motion Sense would suddenly turn into a pumpkin. And at a time when screen to body ratio was a really important bragging right, Motion Sense held the Pixel 4 back with an old fashioned looking top bezel. The cameras though definitely far from bad and in fact quite impressive with the new astrophotography mode just wasn't advancing at the same pace as the competition. Samsung, Apple and Huawei were gaining fast in computational photography, the area that had defined the Pixel camera in previous generations, and those rivals were doing so while adding longer zoom lenses, ultra-wide cameras and bigger primary sensors that the Pixel lacked. The Pixel 4's 2x telephoto looked weak next to the 5x zoom that Huawei had unveiled that year. And even Samsung was more versatile with the Galaxy S9's triple camera setup. Basically, the competition was catching up with the stuff that made the Pixel special faster than Google was improving the fundamentals of its phone hardware. I also wasn't a huge fan of the look and feel of the Pixel 4. It seemed to riff too closely on the iPhone's design language, especially with the new square camera module. Despite the addition of a snazzy new orange colorway, the design itself was just a bit too derivative for my liking. Meanwhile, Google fell behind competitors like OnePlus with an inferior 90Hz panel that was neither as smooth nor as bright as the competition. Pixel 4 owners got all the battery drain of the faster screen, but none of the benefits in terms of smoothness. In fact, the Pixel 4 series was probably the least competitive Pixel to date, resulting in disappointing sales figures and ultimately triggering a soft reset and then a hard reset in the couple of years that followed. Google's 2020 Pixels kind of belong in a category of their own. They arrived into a changed world that was grappling with the social and economic upheaval brought by COVID-19. Neither the Pixel 4a, 4i 5G, nor Pixel 5 were technically as advanced as the Pixel 4 running on Qualcomm Snapdragon 7 series chips without the extra Google hardware like Motion Sense and the Pixel Neural Core. The only real technical advancement was the move towards 5G in the two higher end models. Otherwise, the Pixel 5 was actually a downgrade from the Pixel 4 in quite a few areas. So these were simple phones for complicated times, and Google scaled back its ambitions for the Pixel line at a time when many were just looking for a handset that did the basics with minimal fuss. The Pixel UI gained a few new features like Hold for Me to help you navigate annoying call holds, and new video stabilization modes, plus portrait night mode. But the technological needle didn't really move forward. Instead, Google doubled down on the core experience, making the best possible mid-range phone without any unnecessary gimmicks. Hardware-wise, the Pixel camera experience actually took a step backwards, relying solely on software processing for HDR+. Nevertheless, the five years of experience that Google had with that main sensor allowed the Pixel 5 in particular to punch well above its weight. I wasn't traveling a whole bunch in late 2020 and into early 2021, but I appreciate how the Pixel 5's night mode in particular could really hold its own against much more expensive phones. These were low-key, arguably quite dull-looking phones, but they nailed some of the really important areas where Google had struggled in the past. All three finally banished the series' reputation for terrible battery life thanks to larger cells and smaller screens. The Pixel 4a brought that excellent Pixel camera experience to a more affordable $400 price point, and the Pixel 5 was the premium mini flagship that many fans have been very vocally calling for, with extras like a 90Hz screen, a good one this time, plus wireless charging and a metal unibody featuring a unique bioresin paint job. In the middle you have the Pixel 4a 5G, a clumsily named model that served as sort of a half-step upgrade between the 4a and the 5, filling the role of cheap 5G phone that many carriers wanted at the time. I'm hearing there's a lot of back and forth around the brand names for these Pixel phones, with the 4a 5G in particular having been spotted under the name Pixel 4a XL and even Pixel 5 at one point, with the actual Pixel 5 being spotted under the name Pixel 5s. You get the idea, these were weird phones and it took Google a while to figure out the names that worked. So why was the Pixel 5 such a dramatic departure? One source tells me that this soft reset in 2020 came amid a lot of internal churn at Google and indecision over the direction the series should take. One possible direction that didn't pan out was this, a triple camera Pixel 5 design unveiled by YouTuber John Prosser in early 2020. This design, I'm told, would have packed a more traditional flagship spec sheet as opposed to the mid-range hardware that eventually arrived in the actual Pixel 5. Ultimately though, this never made it off the drawing board and what we got was a continuation of that Pixel 4 design language. The Pixel 5 may have disappointed fans hoping for an all-out Pixel flagship in 2020, 
But this off year gave Google a chance to take stock, with phones that ultimately weren't very showboaty, but nevertheless nailed the fundamentals. In summer 2021, Google effectively wrapped up this era in Pixel history with the Pixel 5a, basically a redesigned slightly larger 4a 5G that was sold in the US and Japan. More countries were originally planned for the 5a, but supply chain fallout from COVID meant that the Snapdragon 765G chipset used in the 4a 5G, 5a and 5 was in short supply. For that reason, it also launched a few months later than had been originally planned, hitting stores right before the launch of Android 12. By the time the Pixel 5a shipped, it was already known that big changes were coming in late 2021, both for the Pixel line and Android itself. In Android 12, Google unveiled Material U, its biggest software design overhaul in almost a decade, with bolder typography, new color palettes that matched your choice of wallpaper, and slick fun new animations. It was a bold new design direction for a Pixel UI that had started to lean a bit too much on a familiar palette of whites and blues. This enormous software overhaul was accompanied by perhaps the biggest Pixel hardware upgrade ever. The Pixel 6 series reintroduced the camera bar from the Nexus 6P as a major design element. And the tech inside that camera bar got a serious upgrade too, built around a new 50 megapixel main sensor and in the Pixel 6 Pro, Google's first periscope telephoto lens. And on the inside, these pixels used Google Silicon for the first time ever. The Google Tensor chipset, built with a helping hand from Samsung, was different from most flagship Android SoCs. It didn't try to catch Apple or even Qualcomm in terms of raw performance, but instead differentiated itself with new Tensor processing units for accelerated machine learning. Effectively, this was dedicated silicon tailored for the unique Google features of this Google phone. On the Pixel 6, that enabled things like Magic Eraser for getting rid of photo bombers in your pictures, while also providing enough power to run Google's HDR Plus algorithms in 4K video for the first time. Later in summer 2022, Google Tensor also enabled many of these features on the year's cheaper Pixel phone, the 6a, which was a mashup of Pixel 5a hardware inside a smaller Pixel 6-ish body, only running that exact same powerful silicon from the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro. Most previous Pixels had some form of fatal hardware flaw if you were to compare them directly to any Android competition. The Pixel 1 lacked water resistance and had only a small amount of base storage. The Pixel 2 series had those disappointing screens. Pixel 3 brought lousy battery life and memory management issues. Pixel 4 had all the drama of motion sense and everything that came with that. And Pixel 5, as much as I liked it, just wasn't really a true flagship. The Pixel 6 was a more confident performance and very close finally to a compromise-free Pixel experience. So where were those compromises? Well, mostly that had to do with the fairly buggy state of Android 12 in its early days. The first couple of major Pixel 6 software updates shipped with numerous bugs, and then the first major bug fix release in December had to be pulled because of a nasty issue causing dropped calls. It wasn't until January 2022, more than two months after launch, that the Pixel 6 got rock solid reliable software. Android 12 in general was in a pretty rough state until right around the end of 2021, but after those vital updates arrived, the Pixel 6 found itself in a much better place. It seemed like after taking a year off in 2020, Google was able to build a much better Pixel flagship in 2021. This wasn't a phone that skimped on the essentials in the belief that Google Magic could make up for missing hardware, but equally it wasn't just another high-end Android phone. The Pixel 6 was both a great high-end phone made better by everything that Google could do. And six years on, with custom silicon at its disposal, there was a lot that only Google could bring to the table. I've spent a bunch of time with the Pixel 6 Pro over the past year, and it's one of my favorite phones of this period, hands down. Material U looks fantastic on this big, expansive canvas, and I appreciate the on-device features like live translation inside chat apps and real tone for more accurate skin tones in shots of people of color. The camera in general is a huge part of why I enjoyed the Pixel 6 Pro more than probably any previous Pixel. The new main sensor raises the ceiling for the kind of shots you can take with a Pixel, while retaining the point and shoot effortlessness that the series is known for. And the new motion features work great with light tracing or fireworks. I'm still not traveling anywhere near as much as I was in the days of the Pixel 2 and Pixel 3, but when I do, I've almost always made sure the Pixel 6 Pro is in my pocket. Which brings us to the new Pixel 7 Pro here, which I've been using for just over a week at the time we're making this video. So while I'm still forming my opinions on this phone, there are a couple of things that stand out right away. Going from 6 Pro to 7 Pro feels really familiar. The hand feel here is almost identical, and the TLDR I guess that this very much feels like a Pixel 6 Pro with an extra level of polish and one or two key upgrades. 
The outer frame and camera bar are now a single piece of aluminium, avoiding some of the awkward joins that you got with the 6 Pro's camera bar. And the fingerprint sensor is quicker too. I never had much trouble with the Pixel 6's fingerprint scanner, but I know some people found it to be slow, and this one's definitely faster. There's a second gen Google Tensor G2 running the show now, with an upgraded CPU and GPU cores and beefier AI capabilities. But the more important hardware upgrade are probably to be found in the camera bar around the back, with a new wider ultra-wide camera that doubles up as a macro lens, and a bump up to 5 times for that telephoto. That 5 times lens can now work in tandem with the main sensor's super-res zoom capabilities, to produce even better shots at around 10 times. Really helps this phone go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Galaxy S22 Ultra. Meanwhile, the new wider ultra-wide camera addresses one of the Pixel 6's major optical weaknesses. This isn't a phone that's going to beat an iPhone 14 Pro or even a Galaxy S22 Ultra in a straight up benchmark race, but it is the most complete vision of what a Pixel can be. Pixel is the phone by Google. It's the phone with a bunch of neat AI tricks that most other phones can't do, and the phone with a really great, really fun camera. It's a phone that's high-end, but less about the specs and more about what you can actually do with it. In earlier years, that argument would have sounded a little hollow, like Google was making excuses for the things that it couldn't do or the expensive hardware that it didn't want to include in its phones. But after a major course correction in 2021, the 7th gen pixels have stuck with the working formula and studiously refined upon it. In 2022, there's never been a clearer case for why there needs to be a Google phone. It's taken seven generations to arrive at this definition of the Google phone and why it makes sense, and while it's unlikely the Pixel will ever be a mass market seller like the Galaxy S, the past couple of years has seen the brand really dig itself out of the hole that it found itself in post Pixel 4 with some really unique and worthy products. The Pixel 7 Pro here is probably my favourite Android phone ever, and I'll get into why that's the case in our next video. It's not the fastest nor the very best at everything it does, but the Pixel secret source, the things that only a Pixel can do, are a big part of it, especially the design refinements and the important low-key camera upgrades this time around. If you've used Google's Pixel phones over the years, be sure to hit the comments to let us know how you've gotten on with them, and if you want to see more longer form videos like this, then be sure to shout out and let me know what you think. But for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.